Welcome everybody to this event, the third global dialogue on ocean accounting. And we are very pleased to have you join us today. This year's Global Dialogue is co-hosted by Ministry of Marine and Fisheries of Indonesia and the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, or DEFRA. The event is supported by UNISCAP, the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, or Ocean Panel, UNSW, K Peninsula University of Technology, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Center for Blue Economy, Monterey, and organized by Global Accounts Partnership, or GOAP, and Rakam Nusantara Foundation. We are very delighted to see representations from many countries where we have over 500 registrants from 65 countries with different time zones, I believe. So it's good to see you here. My name is Rahma Alia, and I am very honored to be here and I will be your facilitator for the day. So just a little bit of housekeeping that we need to comply during this event. We are hoping that you follow all these rules. All participants will be muted and you'll be able to unmute during the Q&A or breakout sessions. Live English transcription is available during plenary and participants can turn it off if they prefer. However, breakout sessions are Catham House rules, so transcription will be turned off. And we also encourage everyone to stay active, ask questions during Q&A, and presenters are also encouraged to answer the questions in the chat box. The committee will also choose maybe one or two questions that will be answered directly by the presenters. You are welcome to turn on your camera and use this as Zoom background. And also, we also encourage you to tweet about the event, in particular during the first session. Please use the following hashtags, GoAppThirdGD and hashtag OceanAccount. So what we're going to have today is a dialogue which is made up of four sessions with two short breaks. Session one is a welcoming and opening remarks, continued by session two, presentations from eight ocean accounting pilots, and then we're going to have a short break, and then we'll go on to the breakout sessions, which we'll be discussing on initiation, implementation, and use of ocean accounts, and then we're going to have another short break, and session four, which is the last session, um, it is the breakout session report to plenary and concluding session. So I encourage everybody to rename your Zoom name. So for example, my name is Alia and I choose to be in breakout Zoom 2. So my Zoom name will be Alia underscore 2. Just a little bit of background on the Go App as well. Since its founding in 2019, Go App has hosted two global dialogues on ocean accounting. And this year's global dialogue built on the previous two editions to reflect on the accelerating progress of ocean accounting globally and discuss practical opportunities for collaboration and actions. Ooh, those are the two important things, don't you think? And this discussion will lay the foundation for the creation of an agenda for action to further ocean accounting efforts globally, as well as strengthen efforts to go beyond GDP to measure and manage progress towards sustainable development of the ocean. These sessions are also intended to be bottom-up with a lot of latitude given to the facilitators to shape and encourage discussion. Each parallel session will also feature one or more discussants who will pre-plan active short contributions that discuss or reflect on their work. And through this event, we are hoping that we can develop a kind of firm actions, maintain people's kind of continuity of thoughts with key outcome on marine accounts that is forward looking. Oh, I'm, I'm looking forward for this. I mean, feel free. We're going to have a very fruitful discussion today. So to start off, let us begin with the opening session where we have three opening remarks. We will begin with the Minister of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia, Mr. Sakti Wahyu Trangono. Let's hear it. Good morning or evening, Excellencies, the Right Honorable Lord Goldsmith, United Kingdom Minister of State, Minister for the Pacific and the International Environment. Excellency Ibu Armida Salsiah Alicia Bana, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. 
It is indeed my great honor and pleasure to join this very important forum, the third global dialogue on ocean accounting toward an agenda for action. The event had to share our policy, program, and actions on the ocean sustainability, particularly on the ocean accounting issues. In this occasion, I will deliver a remark on ocean accounting for sustainable ocean management in Indonesia. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, the government of the Republic of Indonesia has a high commitment to align economic development with the sustainable for the environment. The mandate originates from our law number 32 of 2004 in marine affairs. Economic growth that is based on environmental health is a prerequisite for our long-term development plan. In this regard, we value blue economy as one of mine rebrands to make our ocean sustainable and for the sake of greatest prosperity of the people. Three main pillars of blue economy have been developed as a strategy to pursue this commitment and agenda. Those are ecological health, economic growth, and social inclusion. Those main pillars provide a legitimate basis for safeguarding the health and resilience of the ocean, attracting investment, and providing jobs. Indonesia's active leadership and participation in the international cooperation are based on those national development directions. The transformation of Indonesian fisheries will take off this year, 2022. We envision by 2045 a better regulated and sustainable fisheries. This means that we will have healthy ocean, economic growth, and equal distribution across the nation. Blue economy guides and support market-based mechanism where fisheries products should be sourced from sustainable practices instead. Three main programs have been introduced, namely sustainable fisheries policy based on quota-based approach, aquaculture development for export, and aquaculture that is based on community prominent fisheries product. As a result, in 2035, we target to be the world-recognized sustainable fisheries management. Fisheries GDP, export, and world fisheries share market needs to be increased by 5%, 10%, and 1.8% per annum, respectively. Our market share in fisheries production are projected to raise 23% per annum with more aquaculture than capture fisheries in the years to come. Alongside with the fisheries policy transformation, Indonesia is currently applying a comprehensive marine spatial planning. Using this marine spatial planning, we would like to align and manage multiple stakeholders and sectors' interests that can be very divergent in environment, social, and economic perspective. All activities must comply with marine space allocation, carrying capacity, and impact mitigation. This means that marine spatial planning serves as supreme reference for economic development and environment conservation interests. Distinguished participant ladies and gentlemen, once we establish the target and strategy, the question is how we know if we are on the right track toward the sustainable ocean. What is the status of our ocean ecosystem assets? after implementing those reform fisheries policy and marine spatial planning. The ocean accounting, therefore, is a critical instrument to monitor and measure the impact of our policy on the status of ocean economy and marine resource asset. The ocean accounts are very relevant in the context of our national and global marine spatial management. The agenda on the natural resources accounting has become a global agreement through the Sustainable Development Goal. Convention on Biological Diversity High-Level Panel of Sustainable Ocean Economy. However, we are aware that the tasks are enormous considering our vast ocean. Aspect of human resource capacity, national budget, and the availability of policy and regulation must be overcome. 
Given that complex situation, we establish an interministerial teamwork to develop a pilot of ocean account in Indonesia. The teamwork consists of Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of National Development Planning, Central Statistical Agency, and Agency for Geospatial Information. It is very important occasion. I would like to thank to the UK Government Blue Planet Fund support in assisting the pilot of ocean account in Indonesia. We hope this collaboration can be extended to a nationwide development of ocean account in Indonesia. The momentum is strong and we need to tap this opportunity together. Distinguished participant ladies and gentlemen, finally, as a co-host, I would like to thank the UK government, Global Ocean Account Partnership, Rekam Nusantara Foundation, and all parties that collectively support the preparation and implementation of this Ocean Dialogue. I believe collective action and knowledge are critical to strengthen global effort in Ocean Account that will enable us to measure the progress of the sustainable development of our ocean. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Sakti. I would agree that this is a very strong uh, momentum for everybody to go uh, put efforts towards the ocean sustainability, and we are very happy that Indonesia already had its pilot as well. So now let's hear it for the next opening remarks. Please welcome everybody, Minister of State for Pacific and the International Environment of the UK Government, the Right Honourable Lord Goldsmith. You may go ahead with your presentation. The UK is proud to co-host this dialogue alongside our friends in Indonesia and to be working together on everything from improving marine protection to tackling marine pollution. Thank you, Honourable Minister Sakti Wayu Trengono. Uh, though I can't join you live, it's a real pleasure to be able to say a few words. Now, it's almost impossible to exaggerate the importance of our ocean or the damage that we're doing to our ocean. A healthy ocean underpins the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people and an estimated billion people depend on fish for their main source of protein, including many of the world's poorest communities. But just as we're stripping the ocean of life, we're filling it with rubbish, including ghost fishing gear. And illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing are some of the worst forms of serious organised and transboundary crime that happen on Earth. One of the most important things we can do to support our warming and increasingly acidic ocean is to work hard towards the goals of the Paris Agreement through significant cuts to emissions right across the board. And that point was made so powerfully by representatives from small island states and other climate vulnerable states at COP26 in Glasgow just a few months ago, that the ocean now has a more prominent role in that climate convention. But we also need to protect and restore carbon rich biodiverse marine ecosystems around the world as a top priority. So I'm delighted that a GOAP Pilot has mapped mangroves, corals, seagrasses in the Gilimatra Marine Protected Area in Indonesia, uh, providing nurseries for species, including commercial stocks, uh, coastal protection, and much, much more besides. And many of you will have seen how Costa Rica, Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama electrified COP26 in Glasgow when they announced that they are working together to protect over half a million square kilometers of the Eastern Pacific Ocean. The UK is supporting that grand vision because it's exactly the kind of leadership and cooperation that we urgently need around the world. Indeed, the, the bravery of big nature, big ocean countries helps the UK presidency bring nature from the margins of the global conservation, uh, conversation on climate change into the heart of our response as one of the most effective and cost effective solutions to tackle so many of the biggest challenges that we now face. 
And the world's blue forests are, of course, covered by the landmark commitment made by 141 countries at COP to halt and reverse forest loss by 2030, backed up by commitments that will see trillions of dollars aligned with our climate goals and with the recovery of nature. At the UN Environment Assembly, we agreed a historic resolution to begin negotiating a new legally binding instrument on plastic pollution in the space of just one human lifetime. We've inundated the ocean, but we can now begin to close this ugly chapter. And the rest of this year is filled with opportunities to keep up that momentum. We can conclude negotiations on harmful fisheries subsidies at the World Trade Organization. It can never be right to invest in public money in a way that degrades the public good. We can agree new mechanisms to protect those areas of the ocean that lie beyond national jurisdiction. I'm pleased that the UK is now part of the new high ambition coalition committed to getting that over the line. And when we meet in Kunming for CBD COP15, we can indeed, we must agree the protection of at least 30% of the global ocean by 2030, working in partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities. The UK is proud to co-lead coalitions of more than 100 countries now backing that ambitious target. And the most powerful thing we can do to get everyone on board is to demonstrate an ability to close the huge finance gap that exists for nature, increasing investment from all sources and redirecting existing flows away from destruction and towards renewal. The UK is committed to doubling our international climate finance to 11.6 billion pounds and spending at least three billion pounds of that on nature and nature-based solutions, including marine and coastal environments. And our newly established 500 million pound Blue Planet Fund is supporting some of the world's most important but fragile ocean environments and the communities that rely on them, including through the GOAP. By developing and implementing the tools and understanding that we need to take ocean health into account in all our decisions and measures of success, we can make better progress on every front. As Professor Dasgupta's seminal study makes clear, we must make this the decade that we reconcile our lives and our economies with the natural world around us. And that includes, of course, the health of our ocean. It's an immense challenge but it's up to us to work together across governments, across sectors, across society to see it through. So I wish all the very best for the rest of this important di dialogue. And I thank you so much for inviting me to say a few words. So to keep a healthy ocean, it needs a lot of work, a lot of collaborations, because it is indeed very hard. But we also want to thank you, UK, for helping all the countries in this in this pilot project, especially. So that was opening remarks from Right Honorable Lord Horn. Thank you so much. And we still have one more opening remarks. So let's give the opportunity this time to UNESCAP Executive Secretary. Therefore, let's welcome Ms. Armida Salcia Ali Shabana. Excellency Mr. Sakti Wahyu Trengono, Minister for Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia, Excellency Lord Goldsmith, Minister of State for Pacific and the International Environment of the United Kingdom, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to join the co-hosts for this event, the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and the United Kingdom's Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, in welcoming you to this third dialogue of the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership. The oceans form the basis for the livelihoods of billions of people within the Asia-Pacific region. They contribute to our well-being in many ways, some concretely observable, such as nutrition, economic opportunity and recreation, others harder to measure but no less important, such as culture, a way of life and a sense of place. As we face well-documented threats to regional seas and global ocean, ranging from warming waters to overfishing and land-based pollution, making and implementing sustained ocean positive policy is critical. To formulate smart ocean policy, 
national ministries and decision makers need information on the status and trends of coastal and marine ecosystems. Ocean accounting can provide that information. When ESCAP launched the Global Ocean Account Partnership with Fisheries and Oceans Canada in 2019, we knew it was the beginning of an exciting undertaking that could meet country demands for better, more consistent tracking of the ocean and coastal data in pursuit of ocean sustainability objectives. Indeed, the past several years have borne out this expectation with an increasing number of partners joining the Global Ocean Account Partnership and an increasing number of ocean account pilot projects leading the way into previously uncharted waters. To continue to make progress on ocean account and meet the needs of countries, coordinated action is needed with ongoing commitments at both the national and international levels. In ESCAP Resolution 76-1, governments of Asia and Pacific called for the strengthening of partnership and continued development of national capacities for measurement and accounting in support of sustainable ocean. ESCAP's continued engagement with and support of the Global Ocean Account Partnership responds to this call. We are also advancing the technical implementation of ocean accounting through pilot project activities, including in Palau and Samoa. And through its coordination with pilot projects in the Asia-Pacific region undertaken by the Global Ocean Account Partnership. These pilot efforts provide important lessons learned that will facilitate the eventual regular production of ocean accounts. The system of environmental economic accounting ecosystem accounting adopted as an international standard by the UN Statistical Commission in March 2021 represents a transformative moment in the way that national governments can track their ecosystem assets over time. We are working with the UN Statistics Division and the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership Secretariat to evaluate how this international standard can be best applied to the marine and coastal environment, contributing to the United Nations Secretary General's vision of measuring progress beyond GDP. Through this dialogue today, we will hear the latest updates on global efforts related to ocean accounting and develop ideas for action required to continue the global momentum on ocean accounting. We are at a critical moment for advancing progress towards sustainable ocean and developing standardized approaches for measuring ocean sustainability. I look forward to following the outcomes of the dialogue and working with you to bring its highlights to the attention of decision makers at the 2022 UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon, Portugal in June. Thank you very much. So it was mentioned again that this global um, ocean accounting, to push it forward, it needs collaboration from cross ministries nationally as well as internationally. Thank you once again for the opening remarks, Ms. Armida Salshiali Shabana. And now we want to ask somebody to welcome us once again and deliver the objective of this year's Global Dialogue. Here's somebody who has been leading the collaboration. Please welcome GOAP Secretariat Director Ben Milligan. Please take it away, Ben. Good afternoon, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership Secretariat, hosted by the University of New South Wales, it's a pleasure and a privilege to support our co-host governments and the Rekam Nusantara Foundation to convene this third global dialogue on ocean accounting. Chaired by the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific and by Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the GOAP is a diverse group of like-minded governments and other institutions who are dedicated to accelerating the development of ocean accounts with activities now spanning more than 15 countries. The partnership currently serves as an implementation support mechanism for the commitments on ocean accounting and planning emerging 
from the work of the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy. And it also supports a combination of national programs more generally, plus global efforts to develop and improve technical methods for measurement of progress towards sustainable ocean development beyond GDP. Why are these efforts so important and so urgent? In broad terms, the answer is simple. Without coherent and comparable accounts that bring together social, economic and environmental data, we cannot make effective decisions that maximize the benefits we receive from the ocean, maintain the equity and inclusivity of ocean economies, or unlock the financing capacity that is desperately needed to conserve, restore and enhance the ecological systems on which sustainable ocean development is built. In the two and a half short years since the Go Up was founded, it has been tremendously exciting to witness the rapid progress towards the accounts we need for the future we want for our ocean. But despite all of this progress, we have to recognize that much work remains to be done to collect and integrate diverse data, learn and refine technical methods, and implement the governance reforms needed to ensure that comprehensive ocean accounts are actively used to inform decision making. The second session of our dialogue today highlights current progress on all of these issues. You'll hear presentations from project and knowledge leaders and ocean accounting champions from around the world with an opportunity to provide feedback or ask focused questions. The third session is where we all have work to do. The primary purpose of this dialogue is to identify practical actions that can be taken to accelerate the implementation and use of ocean accounting all around the world. Your discussions today will inform the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership strategic planning and its short-term work plan for the remainder of 2022. Please join the breakout group that you feel is most relevant to you and please contribute as openly as possible to the discussion, safe in the knowledge that the breakout groups are convened under the Chatham House rule, so your comments will not be attributed to you or the institution that you're representing. Close to 500 delegates across 50 countries have registered for this event to participate live or later as part of follow-up discussions for different time zones. That is an enormous collective wealth of knowledge and experience and I'm sure that when our minds meet, we can take a significant step towards a better future for our ocean before 2030 and a long time beyond. Thank you very much. And again, all the best for the discussions. So we have heard from Ben and it is very very interesting that now we're going to hear the current updates or progress from the eight ocean accounts pilots, which are the champion pilots around the world globally. So now let's proceed to the second session, which is one of the core session of this event, where we'll have presentations from eight ocean accounts pilots from around the world, highlighting initiation, implementation and use cases. And ladies and gentlemen, this is just a gentle reminder that each presenter will have about five minutes for their presentations. And we're going to open a Q&A session after the presentation of the first three and at the end of the seventh presentation. So please go ahead. If you have any questions, you may address it to any of the presenters. Just drop your questions on the chat box. And before we start, we do encourage everybody not to tweet during the session, just to make sure that everyone's privacy is protected. And since there's going to be a lot to be discussed as well, so everybody can do it without worrying about ending up online. All right, so I guess we're ready to hear from the pilots. Now we start with Maldives. Presentation will be delivered by Senior Conservation Officer from the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology. Please take it away, Ilham Ato Mohamed. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me. Um, and my apologies that my internet connection is pretty bad and uh, I'm unable to start my video. Um, at this moment. Um, however, I, if you can hear me, I'll continue with the presentation. Thank you very much. So I am Ilham from the Maldives. I work in the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Technology. I uh, have been uh, working uh, to initiate um, 
natural capital accounts uh, in the Maldives for the past few years since 2017. Um, and currently, uh, we are in the initial stages of starting um, ocean accounts in the Maldives. So, uh, ocean accounts in the Maldives, why is it important? Um, Maldives is a 99.9% .9 sea country. It's an ocean country, uh, which means that um, the very little land that we have uh, is also dependent on our oceans. Our ocean is um, more, nearly a a million square kilometers uh, and also uh, our islands, the 1,100 islands in our country, they are divided into small, small pieces of land which are surrounded by coral reefs. They, the coral reefs are the sources of our islands. They originate from them and uh, the mangroves, the livelihoods, and also our economy depend on the coral reefs. Um, and coral reefs is again part of the ocean. So uh, for a country like Maldives, ocean accounts makes complete sense. Uh, and, and there is no land that is uh, not dependent on the ocean and that doesn't arise from the ocean. Uh, Maldives uh, is also developing a marine spatial plan um, and which means um, that we also need to know what our ocean has. Uh, we are developing a, a strategic environmental assessment framework and therefore we need uh, to understand what uh, the assessments will uh, result in or how to do the assessment. So uh, to make sure that our ocean accounts, um, our spatial plans and the CR framework uh, works well, we need to understand the ocean uh, we live in and therefore our ocean accounts, uh, uh, ocean accounts in the Maldives is very crucial to us. Next slide please. Um, so what, what have we done so far? Um, in, in 2017, we initially started on natural capital accounts project through Jeff. Um, and it's through Jeff's six style location. We developed uh, the ended project in the Maldives. And through the ended project, we developed a component uh, to initiate uh, natural capital accounts. And, in, and as I said, in the Maldives, natural capital accounts will be uh, in ocean accounts, and therefore uh, we cannot, um, uh, although we call it natural capital accounts, it's still an ocean accounts in the Maldives. Uh, the, the implementation of the project started in early 2021, um, and we are currently in the process of hiring consultants to do uh, the initial capital accounts. The next steps for us is um, to start working, uh, once we hire the consultant, to start working with the consultant on uh, ocean accounts and uh, to make sure that our natural, uh, our accounts, uh, along with our natural capital accounts, we establish the capacity, the ne necessary resources, and uh, we build the framework within our government system so that it can be carried forward. Next slide, please. So we are facing a lot of challenges and, um, and the first challenge is uh, there is no experience at national level and there is no experience to learn from at international level. There's very little experience to learn from at international level as well. So the expertise and experience is uh, the biggest challenge. And that's why we have been uh, approaching uh, GOP and, um, uh, and also uh, through GOP, we have been approaching uh, other experts to identify uh, the scope of the uh, the scope of the um, I can hear my voice back. There's an echo. Thank you. Um, uh, so, uh, I haven't finished the previous slide. Yeah. So. 
I'm not sure what happened. Uh, so yeah, so we have been facing quite a lot of challenges and uh, we are currently in the process of uh, hiring consultant and developing national capacity. So national capacity is mainly uh, the biggest challenge. Um, thank you uh, once again uh, for the opportunity uh, and looking forward to the presentations and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alhamdulillah Muhammad from Maldives. That was a very exciting presentation, very interesting as well to see the progress there. And now we're moving on to the next, to the second presentation from South Africa and Mozambique, which will be represented by, by, Ken, by Finley, Ken Finley, Country Program Lead. Okay, I believe that everybody couldn't hear me before, so I'll just like to restart what I just said before. So I just wanted to... well. Thanks once again to Ilham Atta Muhammad from Maldives for the very interesting presentation and we're also looking forward for the, pro for the progress there. And now we're going to move on to the second presentation and this time is from South Africa and Mozambique which will be presented by Ken Finley, Country Program Lead, Africa Community of Practice, GOAP and CPUT Research Chair for Ocean Economies. Please go ahead Ken. Uh, thank you, facilitator, excellencies, dignitaries, distinguished participants, colleagues. Uh, good day from Cape Town, South Africa, from where I will be presenting very briefly on two of three recently initiated GOAP Africa Community of Practice uh, pilot study projects. Uh, could I have the presentation, please? Uh, next slide, please. The first of these is Table Bay in the Western Cape of South Africa. Slide, please. Um, and this has been chosen, slide please, for its high sectoral use. Uh, it's it's back a slide, see, slide, see, slide, see, slide, see, slide, see, slide, slide. Could have the next slide, please. Okay, could we advance the slide, please? Uh, <coughs> Table Bay has been chosen uh, for its high sectoral use, uh, multiple sectors, its high protected area status and extent, and, and a number of resource use pressures that are found in the area. Next slide, please. The uh, initial focus has been on two-dimensional marine ecosystem accounts in the coastal zone uh, using Earth observation analyses. Next slide, please. And here I need to acknowledge the uh, SCP and Orfeo plugins of QGIS, the Sentinel-2 multispectral imagery uh, from 2000 to 2001, uh, and the Google, Google Earth Engine platform. Um, next slide, please. So that there are a number of uh, system accounts that we have identified from this region. Um, and these, of course, require ground truthing. Next slide, please. And we will be running uh, some low-level uh, drone UAV imagery, uh, multispectral imagery sampling uh, across the area uh, in order to ground truth what we're getting out of the satellite analyses. Um, next slide, please. We're going to be moving from the marine ecosystem accounts towards pressure accounts, in particular uh, sectors. And then the tourism, port infrastructure, shipping, and uh, effluent discharges, uh, particularly with reference to the DAXA worm frameworks, uh, as well as looking towards this aggregated ocean economy satellite accounts, in particular looking towards demographic inclusivity uh, within the particular sectors that utilize the Table Bay region. Next slide, please. Moving on to the second region of the Bajorito archipelago in central Mozambique, slide please showing where it is, should be coming up, uh, in central Mozambique. Uh, and next slide, please. The area has been chosen for its high biodiversity importance, uh, its protected area status, uh, and a large community versus sectoral in Table Bay for resource use approach, very much more on a community uh, resource use level. 
Next slide, please. As with Cable Bay, the initial focus has been on Earth observation satellite derived marine ecosystem accounts in the near shore in less than 30 meter water depths. And these are particularly important in the Brazilujo region in terms of protected area accounts and blue carbon questions relating to seagrass meadows uh, and mangrove habitats throughout the region. Within the Brazilujo region, uh, we're going to be moving towards, next slide please. Next slide, please. Uh, we're going to be moving towards community-based fisheries accounts within the Basiruto uh, Archipelago National Park and outside of the park. Uh, this is in association with the park authority uh, and are particularly important in terms of uh, important questions in terms of protected area expansion. Next slide, please. So that gives very briefly uh, an overview of what we're doing within these two areas. Uh, we are looking at a third area in the coastal region of Kalifi County, Kenya, uh, and we will be reporting on that, hopefully, uh, in future dialogues. Thank you, facilitator. I'd be very happy to take any questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Sorry, we've missed a slide here. I'd like to acknowledge the UK Blue Planet Fund, which would have been in my last slide. Um, for the support um, of the initiation of these pilot study programs. Thank you. So that was a presentation from Mozambique and South Africa, from Ken Finley. We should call him Professor, but he wants to call just Ken Finley just to make it more casual. But anyway, that was a very short presentation. So if you would like to ask questions, please do so. Just drop a chat in the chat box and then Ken or even Ato Mohammed will definitely answer that for you. And we still have the last presenter for the first half of this session. Let's now invite representation from Fiji, where we have Rup Singh, Senior Lecturer, Economics and Official Statistics from the University of the South Pacific. Please go ahead, Rup Singh, with your presentation. Thank you, facilitator, uh, distinguished panel, um, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've got just about five minutes to complete all that I have to say. So um, I hope you can see the slides. Next slide, please. Well, let me uh, briefly mention that um, Fiji is quite keen on developing the Asian accounts and is a champion on sustainable oceans, um, sign global commitments uh, on oceans and marine management. And these remain on top of the priority list of the local economy. I think the pilot project that that we are actually engaged in supports five out of those seven goals. And at this initial stage, uh, we basically are concentrating on mangroves, looking at the extent cover and estimating some direct SNA benefits out of it. Uh, and then post-March, um, I'll later on explain what we intend to do. Next slide, please. Now this particular slide, um, we want to share some um, uh, initial findings. Uh, accounts of extended cover show that mangrove stretches mainly in the north, east, and central coast of Fiji, and uh, it's about 50,000 plus um, hectares of mangroves um, in 2016, but it has been declining slightly now to about 0.9%. Um, the dense cover has been recorded in Bua, Sherwa, Talibu, and Rewa. Uh, provinces. And I think we've also estimated the above ground biomass as well. These details and much more are there in the report. Secondly, and more importantly, this is um, where I got more uh, interesting uh, results was on the um, estimated direct SNA benefits of mangroves. And at this point in time, given the data that we have, we have initially estimated about USD 20 to 30 million. Um, annual value of um, economy generated from mangroves alone. And this is, um, I think, when we add more induced and indirect benefits, this is likely to go significantly up. And if you look at it, it's about half a percent of Fiji's GDP or GPA in the connected industries where mangroves are concentrated. 
and this accounts for about two percent of um, industrial employment in this uh, in, in this uh, uh, mangrove related activities, and uh, about one percent of that employment in the different industries that that concentrated mangroves. Next slide, please. Um, we intended to show a map to basically show you very briefly, you know, um, where the mangroves are concentrated, but I think that it will give you much more details. Now, what we intend to do post-March, I think this is covering the other slide, um, is that we will want to refine our initial estimates um, because as we understand, uh, Fiji doesn't have a much more dated supply use IO table. And so one of the important things that we want to do is to develop these tables and uh, provide some better estimates or deeper estimates of the um, SME and non-SME benefits. And I think that that will give us a lot of insights on uh, different types of policy dimensions. Um, <clears throat> Uh, through our consultations, uh, we realized that the Bureau of States actually needs this. They're currently working on the supply and use, but they've expressed that, uh, you know, due to lack of technical expertise, probably they will not be able to come up with supply and uh, the IO table. And that's where I think um, we'll want to concentrate a bit. And then um, the Ministry of Environment has also indicated the, uh, the initial interest on studying seagrasses and, of course, fisheries as well. And these are important for people and of course for policy. So we'll want to concentrate there. And of course, there's a need to upskill and train the respective officials who work on these areas. Next slide, please. And of course, um, we draw some tentative conclusions. Um, the pilot supports conservation and protection of mangroves at this point in time. Um, we noted that cover is slowly declining. And uh, we haven't really modeled the impact of other pressures, but I think that's what we want to do moving on. Um, although the estimated benefits are currently small, they can be compounded um, through better integration of mangrove related activity into the formal economic activity. And also, uh, when we provide more detailed estimates using the induced and indirect benefits. Um, the other non SNA benefits, as we realize, these are very, very important, like, for example, coastal protection. And, um, you know, uh, they are a bit hard to quantify. But we expect to provide some details on this as well. But I think the pilot is the first step towards developing the full flash station accounts in Fiji. And I think go up and I think the funders who have got Fiji into this. And uh, there's lots of interest being generated. And um, if things go well in the future, I think we should be able to come up with a more concrete uh, reflections of what's happening in the ocean, how that impacts our economy and vice versa as well. So thank you very much for um, listening. And if there's any further questions, I'll be happy to take that during discussion sessions. Thank you very much, Rup Singh, much. for the presentation. So it seems like everybody was keeping it very strictly to five minutes, which leads us to have uh, about 10 minutes of Q&A now. I'm um, opening it for now. So anybody who has questions for any of the presenter, please do go ahead, just write your question on the chat box. And for now, let me check if there is any question already in the chat box. Right now I have here, Oh, uh, this one is from Richard Jordan, and it is addressed to Maldives. So it's uh, addressed to Ato Ilham Mohammed. The question is, so that everybody can um, know the question as well. Dean of UN, so uh, Richard Jordan is Dean of UN. Since the President of the UN General Assembly, Mr. Abdullah Shahid, has established the Hope Fellows at the UN for training during his presidency, how are you working with the Hope Fellows, or do you envision this after the Ocean Conference? So there you go, the questions, you may answer it. Um, thank you. Um, I, uh, I am not very sure how um, the Hope Fellows are established or working uh, uh, in terms. Um, 
but I believe that it is uh, established under the UN and uh, through the UN General Assembly. So, um, Maldives in particular is uh, not having, a, uh, Maldives does not have any association currently with Hope Fellows on ocean accounts. Um, either right now or later on. Uh, but of course, uh, if it is an avenue that we should be exploring, uh, we will look into it. And uh, if uh, this uh, one of the things that we should do, we will um, definitely uh, try to approach Hope Fellows um, uh, of the UN. Thank you. All right. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Abba Abba for Abba. answering the question from Richard Jordan. And now let's move on if there is already any other questions in the chat box. Let's see, this one is to African pilots, so to Ken Finley then. What, if any, are the challenges expected in integrating the information found as a result of ocean accounts into policy decisions? Go ahead, Ken. Uh, thank you, facilitator. Can you hear me on that? Um, a very interesting question because I think the really important aspect of these pilot studies is to look to how they can be uh, taken up into policy uh, informed decision making processes going forward. Um, I think the important thing here in an African context is the building of an interest and an awareness and what we call an appetite for use of oceans accounts uh, so that over time we get traction uh, of oceans accounting into decision making processes. That's certainly uh, what we consider a major function of the African community of practice. Um, there are um, uh, some challenges. Um, and I think most of those facilitator and uh, to the, to the um, um, question. Uh, can be addressed through uh, capacity development uh, and uh, really showing people the opportunities and the benefits uh, 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 that accounts can produce in a transdisciplinary fashion. I hope that answers the question. Echoes during your um, answer, but hopefully everybody got uh, what Ken Finley was saying. And now let's move on to the next question. Let's see if there is any other question in the Q&A chat box. Sorry, in the Zoom chat. To Fiji, what is the most important thing Fiji needs to do further develop ocean accounts? What is the most important thing Fiji needs to do to further develop ocean accounts? There you go, the question. Thank you, Facilitator. I think um, there are two things which are important now. One is that um, there has to be a lot more uh, engagement with our stakeholders. We tried to get them on board, but there seems to be um, a different fashion through which we can engage them. And so a little breakout um, you know, groups could work. That's one. The second is that uh, we need to work to produce the details of the supply use and IO tables. That will help us to get the final details of what we have done at the moment. And I think that will be quite handy to move further into looking at the satellite accounts and then from there on into full fledged uh, ocean accounts. All right, thank you very much, Rip, for the answer. And now we have another one, it seems like, from Gazelle. And this is addressed to Ken and Rup, um, so two presenters at the same time for one question. And the question is, both Ken and Rup mentioned the use of remote sensing. How does or can this technology support the development of ocean accounts beyond the coastal areas? You may go ahead to answer your question. Maybe Ken go, can go ahead first. Uh, so thank you, facilitator. And I think the important thing here is we need to stratify our ocean area up into coastal, neuritic, and pelagic provinces, uh, certainly approach we're uh, following in the Africa community of practice. Uh, the visual-based or multispectral uh, imagery, uh, visual-based that I've been referring to these, obviously only really uh, talk to uh, where we get adequate light penetration and that really depends on, the, on, on where we are. It's very different for Table Bay, and it is for 
uh, for Basurita or, or Kenya, for example. Um, outside of that, um, in the deep ocean pelagic, I think we need to turn to uh, a very much more coarse uh, resolution accounting process that incorporates oceanographic data, can be remote sensed oceanographic data in terms of temperatures, salinities, uh, uh, productivity, et cetera. Uh, but it's absolutely critical, we think, in, to incorporate these oceanographic data uh, into these accounting uh, processes. The in-between area, the continental shelf area, is, is somewhat more difficult uh, because uh, of the way remote sensing behaves uh, in this area. We can't use the visual side of things, uh, and certainly the oceanographic-based uh, models are not as uh, accurate, I should say, within, that, within, within the coastal zones. Uh, and there we need to turn much more to in situ data uh, for measuring uh, particular ocean characteristics uh, to, develop, to, to develop accounts. And I think what we need to look at towards, look towards as well is to the spatial resolution that we develop these accounts at, because they need to be very different uh, very different spatial scales, very different um, basic spatial unit sizes uh, for different systems. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. So and what, uh, what about, what, about Rup, what, do you think? Rup, what do you think? Thank you, Gisaldita. I totally agree with Ken. I think we have to use some integral technology. Uh, remote sensing helps, but there is some limit to it. And so going beyond, we have to use other things just like what Ken has mentioned. Thank you. That was very concise, but hopefully it answers the questions. Um, um, don't worry if anybody still want to ask questions. We still are going to open another Q&A session after the next presentations. So uh, let's begin again with the second half of the session, where we will have uh, presentations from eight pilots of ocean accounts around the world. And here we have from Indonesia, represented by Irfan Yulianto from IPB University, who is also representing Rekam Nusantara Foundation. Go ahead, Irfan, with your presentation. Uh. Thank you, Alia. I would like to uh, provide an update uh, related to uh, ocean account development and implementation uh, in Indonesia. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, Indonesia has high commitment related to uh, ocean accounts uh, implementation in Indonesia as it is mandated under the Indonesian law and regulation. And for two decades, Indonesia has been implementing uh, SEAA for uh, environmental assets, especially for the terrestrial where the information, all of the information compiling under the system seasonal link system and uh, Indonesian government would like to replicate this initiative into the only uh, to in Indonesian oceans as a ocean accounts initiative. Next slide, please. The ocean account initiative led by Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in collaboration with the Ministry of uh, National Development Planning, Planning Ministry of Finance, Plastic Indonesia, and Youth Spatial Agency. It was in 2020 where all of the ministries uh, agreed to have uh, uh, priority activities and list of location and the time frame between 2021 and 2024. And it was agreed that all of the ministries uh, will do the ocean, ocean accounts pilot in 10 MPS in Indonesia. Next slide, please. And in September uh, 2021, last year, the first national workshop of ocean account was implemented. It was attended by all of the parties from government, universities, NGO. And then uh, in, in the national workshop, uh, scoping assessment was conducted using the ocean diagnostics tool, where we, we did the assessment on, on Indonesian policy uh, framework and uh, strategic planning and also operationalization methodology priority challenges on opportunity related to uh, ocean accounts uh, development and implementation in, in Indonesia and this uh, national workshop uh, supported by a uh, go up next slide please and then this is in parallel with, with the national workshop we also implementing the uh, pilot of uh, ocean accounts uh, it is in a uh, Gilimatra MPA 
uh, in the beginning, we plan to have Ocean Account Pilot in 10 MPAs. However, due to COVID pandemic situation, we only can do in one MPA in Indonesia. And then we uh, uh, we evaluate the ecosystem extent, uh, flow to economy, flow to environment, and also uh, uh, governance accounts of, of this M MBA. And then next slide, please. And in the beginning of uh, this year, 2022, we did, uh, Indonesian government did a capacity building to uh, cross ministries in Indonesia. It was attended by uh, 56 participants joining the training that covered the regu regulatory framework, methodology, data interpretation for, for decision making related to the ocean accounts in Indonesia. Next slide, please. And then from more than a year, uh, less than two years implementation in Indonesia, we have a lesson learned where a collaborative action and dedicated team is are very important for develop ocean account and implement ocean account in Indonesia and collaborative action related the database and data set pulled together in one areas where, where every organization can access the data set and then become a pilot for the ocean account is very important also. And the last thing related the capacity building, since this is quite new quote and quote for 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 indonesia we need to have like a capacity building to have a coordination to be at the same page and consultation with the expert how to develop and implement ocean accounts in indonesia and next slide please and here is the uh, roadmap for the ocean accounts uh, implementation in indonesia all of the ministries uh, universities and uh, NGOs agreed that that uh, fisheries accounts and also mangrove, seagrass, coral reef, and, and other imp uh, important benthic habitats become the uh, priority for ocean accounts in Indonesia. And then there are specific uh, account that already agreed. And then we have our five uh, activities or component that will be implemented in the following uh, five years. And then a lot of mechanism. Uh, that already agreed uh, amongst uh, ministries and also uh, other institutions related how we implement and develop ocean accounts in Indonesia. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irfan Yulianto. It's great to hear it from Indonesia, where uh, there was initiative um, action and collaborative action. Also, um, the um, Gili Matra as a pilot and the roadmap you know, uh, towards uh, the, the development of the ocean sustainability. We're looking forward for that. And now, let's move on to the second presentation, and let's hear it from Vietnam, which will be presented by Viet Ang Huang, Technical Lead, Vietnam Ocean Accounts Pilot, uh, Viet, um, Viet An Huang, you may go ahead with your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone from Hanoi. Uh, we are very uh, exciting to learn uh, and hear experience from uh, other country and uh, how you uh, implementing your ocean account. So now I would like to share the uh, reason uh, of uh, our, our pilot study. Uh, so we did it uh, from uh, October uh, last year with the support from uh, GOAP and uh, University of, uh, of um, uh, um, uh, South Australia. Uh, the main implementing agency in Vietnam is uh, East Pondre, the uh, Institute of uh, Strategy uh, and Policy for uh, Natural Resources and Environment in uh, Vietnam. The team, uh, we have uh, five people with uh, uh, different background, and I'm here to uh, present the work uh, from the team. So, uh, next slide, please. So, a bit uh, on the context of uh, how ocean, uh, ocean economy is important to Vietnam. Uh, we have a teen country with a very long coastal uh, line area, about 3,000 uh, kilometers, and uh, about 72% of our po po population, and uh, more than 80% of our 
uh, rice production is the main food in Vietnam are uh, produced in, in coastal province. Uh, the uh, ocean economy needs to contribute to about 48% uh, percent of the country's GDP. Of course, it's uh, both uh, uh, direct and, and indirect, and it was a rough uh, estimation from uh, some previous uh, policy. And uh, uh, now with, with the, uh, the actual uh, ocean accounting system, we, we hope to uh, recalibrate uh, this uh, Uh, this uh, value for the home country as, as well for, for the different uh, provinces. Uh, the government of Vietnam have uh, issued the uh, highest uh, level of uh, strategy on uh, sustainable development of uh, ocean uh, economy uh, in uh, 2018. And uh, uh, this uh, strategy is, is now uh, embedded uh, uh, on onto the um, uh, different uh, uh, economic uh, development program in Vietnam. Uh, however, the uh, information uh, on, on ocean is uh, quite uh, frag uh, fragmented. That leads to very difficulty in quantifying the value of uh, ocean economy and, and impact uh, of uh, economy on, on ocean health. That's why we are very keen to, uh, to participate uh, in, um, in this study. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so... Uh, Uh, for the reason of uh, our, our ocean accounting, uh, we uh, conducted it uh, at uh, the uh, one province named uh, Quảng Ninh. It's uh, near the uh, border with uh, China. It's a very important uh, province for sea uh, transportation, uh, coal mining, and, and tourism. Uh, so we choose the uh, open account for 2015 and closing account for 2020. It, it's mainly... Uh, due to the uh, availability of, of uh, data. So for the uh, um, uh, ocean economy, uh, we uh, estimate the uh, uh, contribution of, uh, of uh, ocean economy to the uh, province uh, GDP. It's um, uh, 4.8% in 2015, and it uh, reduced a bit to, 2020, um, to 8% in 2020. It, it's mainly because of the COVID uh, situation. Uh, for the uh, ocean economy, within the ocean economy, the uh, the, the sector with uh, uh, highest value is the uh, aquaculture and 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 fishery. Um, it uh, contribute uh, more than third uh, of, of, uh, more than thirty percent um, uh, to the ocean economy. And uh, for for this. Uh, Uh, we um, uh, already uh, recommend the uh, province and government to look uh, further uh, at, um, uh, at this uh, sector uh, because it, it contributes more to more than one third of the, uh, of the ocean economy. So how the province can uh, further uh, investment uh, to, to help the uh, aquaculture and, and fishery sector to uh, um, to uh, improve the, the value like for example the uh, uh, processing of, uh, of, of uh, seafood product to, to have a higher value uh, on uh, uh, on the ecology um, uh, accounting uh, we look at uh, 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 three main things uh, mangrove uh, forest uh, seagrass and uh, coral reef uh, so for mangrove uh, forest we were very lucky that uh, Vietnam have a very good uh, forest monitoring uh, program that uh, updated uh, annually. So um, from uh, 2015 to 2020, uh, we uh, uh, have uh, the mangrove uh, forest extend uh, quite stable. It's uh, uh, with about uh, 2% increase. And uh, we also uh, conducted uh, uh, independent uh, uh, satellite uh, image classification for mangrove uh, in, from the same period. And uh, it uh, give uh, more or less uh, uh, the, the same area, about 10% different. And we think uh, it, it's uh, quite reasonable because, uh, uh, because of the accuracy of, uh, uh, of the image uh, classification. So for mangrove, we think that uh, um, the uh, uh, independent uh, very, um, verification from uh, satellite image uh, gives the same reason as the uh, Um, uh, annual reporting. Uh, but uh, we also noted uh, from the uh, economic uh, planning of the province that uh, uh, from uh, next year, there will be uh, seven um, uh, industrial parks uh, 
um, uh, constructed it it some side that they will uh, um, replace some some mangrove area so maybe in in the next um, uh, accounting period we will see the uh, the mangrove uh, reduce uh, significantly so for this we recommend the province to uh, closely uh, monitor the area that uh, or, um, already uh, issue uh, the uh, the approval for mangrove forest, but uh, make sure that it will not go beyond the uh, the, the allow area, and also um, uh, make sure that the the um, the lost mangrove forest will be replanted elsewhere. Uh, for seagrass, uh, uh, about half of the size that uh, we have seagrass in Quang Minh have the, um, the seagrass cover reduced by 50% during the uh, uh, the time between uh, 2015 and 2020. And uh, one of the seven uh, uh, seagrass species uh, have been uh, no, no longer observed in, in the area. So like a sharply decrease of uh, both uh, uh, area and, and species. Uh, for coral reef about um, uh, also, uh, it's it's a very sharp uh, decrease uh, in um, uh, in uh, in the num both number of species and and the health of coral reef. Uh, in some side of the uh, of, of Quảng Ninh, the uh, number of uh, species reduced by more than eighty percent. Other side, it's about fifty percent. Uh, for the uh, uh, Environment condition. We mainly look at uh, at the wastewater. So for household water, we estimated that uh, only about ten uh, percent of the household water have the centralized treatment uh, facility. And uh, uh, in uh, 2020, uh, there is uh, no change. So uh, we see that uh, the uh, 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 large part of household wastewater. Uh, it's only uh, treated by by small size uh, facility, and it uh, eventually will, will go out to the watershed and and to the sea. Uh, for addition, uh, uh, wastewater, uh, the uh, in 2015, the um, uh, uh, treatment capacity uh, installed by province it's uh, uh, already accepted uh, the uh, the amount of, of wastewater from industry, so that reflects the. Uh, uh, the the uh, uh, province investment on uh, on on protecting the uh, the environment by installing the um, the the wastewater treatment capacity and uh, in 2020 the uh, the capacity it increased by by 100 percent uh, for um, the uh, surface uh, water condition. So most of the uh, survey water condition uh, stations that uh, we have um, the, the, the data, uh, the, uh, the the condition is still within the uh, national um, standard, but we see the uh, slightly increase in uh, COD, BOD, and uh, uh, TLS uh, throughout the year. Uh, for the groundwater, uh, we also see a slightly uh, increase uh, in uh, uh, in the pH, but uh, the, the the water quality is still, uh, yeah, still in the um, in the uh, national standard uh, for the uh, sea water. The water uh, uh, from inshore line that mean uh, about uh, five kilometer away from uh, from the coast, and it's uh, in uh, in good condition and slightly better. That's uh, the near the near coast uh, water. It's uh, with uh, slightly uh, decrease in um, turbidity and also in COD, but still within the uh, uh, the nation standard. Uh, so uh, in short, uh, the, um, the 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 environment condition uh, it. Uh, Uh, it uh, slightly de decrease, but uh, the uh, the province uh, also uh, uh, invest a lot in uh, in um, stabilizing the uh, uh, the environment condition. So next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. 
Yeah, so uh, some uh, conclusion and, and uh, the challenge we see, uh, the, um, the ocean ecology um, survey that uh, we have is not designed for the accounting data would uh, scatter and it's not comparable uh, through the year. So it's uh, very difficult to, to, to do the, uh, the accounting on, uh, for example, on, on uh, biodiversity index. Uh, we uh, lack a uh, measurable biodiversity of uh, ocean fish. Uh, so the solution for this, we uh, suggest that the government improve the investment and direction for more uh, systematic uh, research and uh, survey. Uh, for the environment data, we uh, like up, uh, data on actual waste water emission from uh, treatment. Uh, data was keep in uh, silo and uh, difficult to get access. So we suggest uh, to to legalize uh, reporting of environment data uh, as part of the official accounting framework. And also for ocean economy, we suggest to improve the official statistics survey that uh, includes the uh, uh, the, the indicators that are tailored for and uh, uh, for the ocean economy, including spending on environmental remediation. And the last but not least, we uh, would like to have uh, the uh, openness line and uh, integration of uh, ocean account in the pro, uh, planning uh, process. Thank you. Thank you, Viet. It was very mind-opening to see how the 83% of the rice production is happening in the coastal provinces and 48% of the GDP comes from the ocean economy in Vietnam. So it stresses again how important it is to keep our ocean healthy. So thank you again from Vietnam of your presentation. And now let's move on to the next one. We want to hear it from the UK where we have Adam Dutton, Branch Head of Natural Capital Accounts at Office for National Statistics, United Kingdom. Go ahead, Adam. Hi, uh, thanks for welcoming me here. Um, I'm going to run through a few aspects of the technical development of our marine accounts. The UK has been producing natural capital accounts since uh, 2015, and we had the project been running since 2011. The marine, first marine accounts were produced in 2020. Um, if you go to the next slide, we were able to produce one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine services, um, two of which were entirely new, that we hadn't produced five years before, no, three of which were entirely new. Those were carbon sequestration for marine carbon, um, wastewater remediation and flood protection. You can see that the overall value was 200 billion in asset terms. That's around a fifth or a sixth of our overall natural capital asset value from the UK. Um, the largest service by value was recreation. This is quite common across our accounts because recreation, uh, but the price basis for recreation is essentially retail, whereas most of these are the uh, produced at sort of wholesale equivalent price. Um, you also see carbon sequestration is very high. Um, that's certainly uncertain. A lot of these are produced based on mapping. We basically mapped a range of habitats and were able to apply uh, sequestration rates to a range of those habitats, just to a fraction of those habitats. Um, but there's very large um, standard errors at the moment, confidence intervals around the estimated amount of carbon that can be removed per hectare of given um, marine habitats. So we expect that to change quite significantly in coming years, though as a proportion of our overall marine service, it's probably likely to remain quite high. Um, wastewater remediation is also worth a brief mention in that essentially what we're valuing is the capacity of the ocean to take pollution from our rivers that otherwise we would need to clean within our rivers. And I think for that yeah, reason, it is at, at least at controversial. controversial. And we and should probably at some point consider the damage that's being caused by the uh, wastewater remediation going into the sea. We need to estimate um, marine eutrophication and net that's off of those costs. And despite that, the pairing quite large, I think it's probably an overestimate. So the two that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail, I've only got five minutes, are fish capture and uh, salt marsh flood protection work. So if we go to the next slide. In our fish capture work, in older work, uh, pieces of work that we had been doing, we had been relying on national accounts to estimate our fishing 
value using a resource rent approach. Essentially, we take the fishing industry's, um, an approximation of the fishing industry's profit at the UK scale. However, there's a large number of fish that are caught in UK waters, which are landed in other docks um, globally. Uh, and those fish would not have kept been counted towards the UK's national accounting um, capture of fishing. And also there would be fish caught outside of the UK's exclusive economic zone, which would be caught within our harbours, and they would have been included in our national account. So it would have been a misspecification. So we started to work towards um, a system, a, a data set that would allow us to build up from the ground up. So rather than working at the kind of top-down approach from national accounts, we would look at what is actually caught and where it's caught. Um, and there is a number of benefits to that. One, it would produce a better value, but it also enables us to add uh, condition um, metrics to that to a bet to better understand what's happening underneath the overall numbers. And uh, to explain that, that first picture is basically the ice rectangle. So that tells us where the landings are. That second picture is essentially the UK's EZ, the, the, the blue part. And we lay that over the ICs rectangle to work out how much fish of which species are caught within UK's waters. We can then match that to sub FAO subregions. And in when we do that, we can match it to IC stock assessments. So once we match it to stock assessments, we can basically check that fish fishing pressure isn't too high and also that the spawning biomass is, isn't too low. And if it meets both those requirements, we classify that particular stock as um, sustainable. We were then able to take estimates of the um, basically the landed profitability by species um, from the UK's uh, fishing fleet. Um, and we do that using there's some survey work done by an organisation called Seafish, who estimate those prof that profitability for us. And we apply that across the board. We can then look at the total profitability and what proportion of that profitability, uh, what, what proportion of the income from fishing is unsustainable and what proportion of that fishing is sustainable. And that will affect our ability to estimate an asset value going into the future. So if it's unsustainable, we assume a 25 year lifespan. And if it's sustainable, we can achieve a hundred year lifespan and we come up with a more accurate asset value for fishing stocks in that way. So it's still relatively simple. Um, longer term, there's a kind of, Sorry, my time is up already. Okay, um, I'll leave it then. Thanks very much. Unless you want to finish for a couple more slides. I'm sorry, I mistimed it. Thank you so much, Adam Dutton. It is indeed very true that our time is very limited. But thank you for the presentation. And I believe that we should next uh, move forward to the next one, which is from Canada. And this presentation is pre-recorded. Let's hear it from Jessica Andrews, Senior Research Analyst Statistics Canada. And if you have questions for Jessica, please do write on the chat box and also include your email so we can connect you to Jessica. Let's hear it. Hello. Today, I am going to talk about the uh, progress that has been made with Canadian ocean accounts. Um, this work has been done by Statistics Canada and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. I'm going to start with the progress that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has been made. They've been working on a blue carbon project in collaboration with the University of British Columbia. Preliminary results indicate that the extent of eel grass in Canada is estimated at just over 140,000 hectares with corresponding carbon stocks of approximately seven to 800,000 tonnes. This work um, used new core data from all three coasts um, and gives the first um, estimates of blue carbon stocks along all Canadian coastlines. You should note that these are lower estimates than published global estimates, highlighting the importance of further Canadian research. Note that extent is conservative as much as the coastline has not yet been surveyed and that the carbon stocks were reported at depths of 60 centimeters versus the global standard of one meter. DFO has also been engaging with the OECD to further develop the marine economy accounts. They continue to improve their measurement of ocean economy by incorporating methodologies and best practices, practices obtained through um, participation in the OECD Ocean Economy Working Group. These improvements are expected to result in more precise measurements of the interlinkages that exist between ocean-based industries and, ge and geographic effects in 
near term. Um, development of a full set of ocean accounts is currently hindered, however, by available data in specific ocean sectors. DFO, DFO also put out a joint publication of Canada's oceans and the economic contribution of marine sectors with Statistics Canada last summer. This publication includes information on the contribution of marine sectors to GDP and employment nationally and provincially, as well as protected marine area and coastal population. Statistics Canada has also made good progress over the last year. Uh, a big event for us was that the Census of Environment received funding in December, and this will ensure that the work on the pilot project for ocean accounts will be able to continue under the umbrella of the Census of Environment. We also had the inclusion of preliminary data for ocean accounts published in Accounting for Ecosystem Change in Canada this January. This includes data for extent of kelp, seagrass, salt marsh, and cold water coral. We also looked at the condition variables of sea surface temperature change, as you can see in the map on the right, sea surface salinity change. Um, we looked at the change in minimum sea ice extent. Um, and as you can see from the chart below, there's been a significant decrease in sea ice extent in September um, over the last four decades. We looked at fishery stock sustainability, and we also looked at human modifications in the forms of aquaculture and oil licenses. We've also spent this year looking at how we would build condition and services accounts for salt marsh, choosing variables and thinking about different metrics that could be used. This has been written up and we will be looking at um, actually um, calculating the variables for these accounts over the next few years. In terms of challenges, uh, resources are still a challenge, although getting better. Um, better funding is now in place thanks to the sense of environment, um, but the team will need to grow uh, to meet the, the new expectations that we have now that we're not a pilot project. Um, sadly, we lost a key team member, however, at DFO this year in Michael Bort. Um, he contributed a lot to the ocean accounts and uh, is, so is really missed. Um, in terms of data issues, Canada has a long coastline. Um, as such, our data sets tend to have some spatial gaps and um, due to the difficulty of obtaining data often are over um, long time periods. So because of this, it's, it's questionable for many variables if we're going to be able to produce open and closing accounts. Um, we are still working on locating and acquiring existing DFO data, um, as well as data from other government organizations. And we will also need to think about how to prioritize, collect and integrate um, new data sets in general. In terms of next steps, um, we are planning on putting out first versions of ocean and coastal extent and condition accounts using the, the preliminary data that was in our publication this year. Um, we're also looking at uh, data gathering and modeling to produce variables for salt marsh and other accounts. And we're planning on beginning engagement with data suppliers and users, as well as Indigenous groups, NGOs, and other interested parties. For more information, please contact myself, Jessica Andrews at stackhan.gc.ca or Masan Agbagala at dfompo.gc.ca. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Jessica. So we had heard from all of the presenters on the session. And again, now we open for Q&A session. So just to make it equal for everybody, I have picked one question here in the chat box that goes to Irfan from Indonesia, Viet from Vietnam, and Adam from UK. Unfortunately, we can't do it for Jessica for now. So this is the question. Do you think underwater culture heritage should also be taken into consideration when talking about ocean governance. Shipwrecks are being used for thousands of fish species as artificial reefs. Underwater cultural heritage can also be a high important touristic attraction. These are just examples of some of the importance of this heritage. Should it not be considered topic in all the ocean decisions? This one is from Elena Perez. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Yes, I agree that uh, uh, ocean heritage should be under the ocean governance. In Indonesia, we recognize the system 
uh, where we have like a ministerial regulation related uh, uh, heritage sites as MPA in Indonesia, and also we all we also recognize the customary people as a uh, as a uh, uh, one one of governance system in Indonesia. So the in 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 within my knowledge, there are two uh, heritage sites that already declared as MBA in Indonesia in in uh, western part of uh, Java Islands. Uh, there is one heritage site, and in Bali, uh, one heritage site that already declared as MBA. I think this is one of an example where the heritage sites become uh, MBA in Indonesia. It is not only the ship ship wreck, but also the customary people. Uh, can be MBA also in Indonesia. I think that's all. Thank you. I, I would also broadly agree. I don't know much about um, regulation. I know that in the UK there's interest when uh, cultural circles of replicating the kinds of work that we've done in terms of natural capital for cultural protected areas. So um, while you might be able to include things like cinema within culture and you can, you can apply a very large economic value to it, Things like old Iron Age forts or um, a prehistoric dockyard, which is in, in Dogalat you know, off the coast of the UK, probably doesn't attract the same kind of funding. And um, they want to think about how they can capture some of the benefits that are produced by them. And I think that's an interesting way to look at it, because I think the question specifically mentions the complex interactions between um, spawning grounds and cultural heritage within the, within the marine environment and potentially um, I think trying to bring it within the broader umbrella of natural capital enables you to capture some of those crossover effects um, but obviously there's a range of different types of protection that's necessary for those um, cultural sites and it gets a little bit complicated if you change the high watermark to you know excuse the, the, the metaphor the change the high watermark for the range of things that you're trying to capture obviously those yeah, if people are visiting those sites and they're in the marine environment, they will show up in the recreational accounts of our accounts. Um, but whether we would specifically notice the cultural aspects of it yet, we probably wouldn't, but we are making efforts to try and make a better uh, list of that. Um, go ahead, Ian. Yeah, I don't have much uh, experience on, on uh, heritage uh, marine area, but my common sense is that uh, the uh, the heritage area or maybe the, uh, the marine protected area it's uh, the side where you can have a better um, uh, data because it, it's a protected area there are more research and study in this area and those uh, will be uh, reflecting on on uh, the the, uh, the ocean uh, ocean health so even even it's a small area but uh, uh, it's good for education and, and also uh, with uh, better uh, uh, research data. It uh, one will be the key for, 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 for collecting data for, for uh, ocean ecology. Thank you, Viet, for your answer. And we still got time for one more question. Let me read it out to you. This one is from Joel Kapalitz to all, to Irfan, Viet, and as well as, also only to Irfan and Viet, actually. So the question is, are local governments in your areas solid in implementing national and local policies as far as ocean governance is concerned? Uh, yeah, we uh, have uh, one uh, workshop with the uh, local uh, province uh, presenting uh, our initial finding, and uh, they are uh, very um, uh, very welcome uh, our study reason, and they, they want to um, have it uh, further integrated into their province or master planning. Uh, but uh, also uh, they. Uh, not not fully disagree, but they, they say like some of our calculation uh, it's it's a bit different from uh, from the, the uh, in province uh, uh, calculation. For example, on on the uh, uh, ocean economy, uh, of course, uh, because of the short term period and also uh, uh, different uh, different uh, data source. But uh, yeah, they are they are very keen in in uh, applying uh, this for for the uh, for the local government planning. All 
right. Thank you so much for your answer. So that wraps up this session and the Q&A as well. So I would like to invite everybody to give a round of applause for all the uh, ocean pilots, ocean accounting pilots from all around the world, the presenters, and for all of you who stay active during this event. I believe you're clapping there virtually, even though I cannot hear them. So now it allows us to have a break. You may grab a snack or supper if you like, maybe a cup of coffee, because after this we'll enter the breakout rooms where we have three breakout rooms that will discuss uh, different um, uh, topics there. And the objective of the breakout rooms is actually to discuss further, um, which probably attendees have uh, ideas generator for a list of actions that attendees think are needed to ensure that ocean accounts live up to their potential of enabling measurement and management of progress towards ocean sustainable development. Okay, so let's have a break for about five minutes and I'll see you again after that.
everyone. Welcome back to the third Global Dialogue. And we're about to enter the breakout session. Now, um, the objective of this breakout session is to serve as an engine room or ideas generator. So if you have any uh, things that you think that this is needed to ensure that ocean accounts live up to your potential of enabling measurement and management of progress towards a sustainable uh, of ocean development, please do go ahead and discuss it in the um, breakout session. And these actions will then feed into the closing session and serve as a potential basis for a partnership agenda for action and on ocean accounting. So consistent with the spirit of the dialogue and the go up in general, these sessions are also intended to bottom up with a lot of latitude given to the facilitators to shape and encourage discussion. Each parallel session also features one or more discussants who will pre-plan active short contributions that discuss or reflect on their work. And also we see that it is important that you listen carefully and take notes during these breakout rooms. So just in case you uh, are unsure of which room you want to enter, we have three breakout rooms. The first one is uh, going to be discussing on the initiation and scoping of ocean accounts, focusing on demonstrating the relevance of and value of ocean accounts in different decision-making contexts, and will be facilitated by Ferdaus Agung, Coastal Management Planner from the Minister of Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of the Indonesia. Also, in the breakout session two, is going to be discussing the impl implementation of ocean accounts, focusing on technical approaches and methods required for effective delivery, and it will be facilitated by Kin Finley, the country program lead, Africa Community of Practice, GOAP, and CPUT Research Chair on Oceans Economy. And on the third room, it will be discussing about the use of ocean accounts, focusing on establishing enduring connections between the accounts and different decision-making processes concerning ocean sustainable development. And it will be facilitated by Jonathan Co, Director Center for Environmental and Satellite Accounts at Australia Bureau of Statistics. We will have about 45 minutes of breakout sessions. So please do change your Zoom name if you haven't done so by your name underscore the number of room that you choose to be in in the group uh, of uh, breakout session and we're going to have about five minutes until you get switched into the respective room that you choose.
Hi everyone, welcome back to the main plenary room here. I had a peek on the three groups um, discussing on different topics. It was very interesting. Um, I hope you also had a great discussion in each of the breakout session that you entered. And hopefully you, you also keep your spirit high because we're about to enter one of the most important session as well, which is the report to the plenary session from the rapporteurs. So now um, we will have again another 10 minute break. This will allow the rapporteurs to collect notes to make important points so that everyone don't forget of what was discussed during the breakout sessions. All right, so let's give the time to the rapporteurs and we'll see all of you again in 10 minutes time.
Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to greet everybody again. So we have come to the last session. Now, um, this is the report back to the plenary. I believe that you discussed on three things on the three different group uh, session of the breakout session, which is the initiation, implementation, as well as the use cases. So now we have allowed um, the rapporteurs to take notes, also important points, which hopefully this will formulate as a basis for the agenda towards action. All right, for the first one, let's hear it uh, from the rapporteur from group one, where we have Tai Lorero. So Tai, the time is yours. Thank you very much. So in our breakout session, which was about initiation and scope in our ocean accounts, we heard different experience from various countries and we identified key challenges and also key opportunities. The first key challenge I would mention was the fact that in many cases, ocean accounting is a new concept among stakeholders, and that sometimes hampers the understanding of how to implement it, what's the importance, how to align ocean accounting with what's going on in the country and the policy needs. So this was one of the challenges identified. And that's actually also connected to the second challenge identified, which is, which is the stakeholder engagement. Uh, we also discussed how it's sometimes difficult to deal with data access and data quality. And another issue or another situation uh, identified was the collaboration among various institutions and uh, practitioners from different areas. That's also something uh, that sometimes can, can, can be a challenge. And as I, um, key opportunities, so how to overcome such challenges we identified one main um, opportunity, which is actually communication and how communication can actually help improve many of the challenges we identified. So communication can help um, with awareness that can improve ocean accounting awareness and uptake among different stakeholders. That is also related to capacity building, which is also a great, uh, it's a big opportunity. And communication is also involved to dialogue and experience sharing, which is something that can help overcome challenges experienced by different practitioners. Communication is also related to the improvement in the collaboration side of things. So how different stakeholders can better collaborate and uh, also with stakeholder engagement and early stakeholder engagement actually, which is also an opportunity. Uh, it's important to to engage stakeholders since the beginning of the process of scoping and in, um, initiation of ocean accounting. And finally, how science and policy making can, how ocean accounts can be an important approach to help bridging science and policy making. So those were the key opportunities identified. And another important thing to mention, which is in both sides, challenge and also opportunity is, better streamline how to align ocean accounting implementation with other uh, ocean governance approaches already being used by various countries. So how ocean accounting can be aligned to ongoing work. Thank you very much. Thank you much, Tyler, for your notes. It was very highly appreciated. Okay, now let's hear it uh, from the second rapporteur. We have Ken Finley from, the, uh, from Group 2. Go ahead, Ken. Thank you, uh, facilitator. I'm just uh, wondering if the first group were just listening in on, on our discussion because there's a lot of overlap with what we what we talked about. Um, and so um, I just need to draw on here. Um, so we initially discussed uh, a progress with particular accounts and accounts that have been implemented. And what came across quite clearly is that there were a number of different accounting areas that had been looked at in different uh, by different. Uh, countries, by different uh, regions, et cetera. And these uh, really extended from uh, environmental, uh, economic accounts, uh, ecosystem accounts, e um, economic accounts, pressure accounts, the aspects of blue carbon accounts, uh, that all tied into aspects of um, marine economy. Um, and um, so the other thing that was identified that this is quite a strong interest in, uh, in uh, the growing interest in, in these accounts going forward. 
um, and, and particular uh, regions were identified here, uh, for example, in the ocean or the, the North Sea particularly. Uh, in relation to the opportunities that are uh, offered by uh, oceans accounting processes, uh, particularly um, there was some very interesting discussion in terms of uh, alignment with existing processes, uh, particularly in terms of the, uh, of the European region. Uh, marine strategy framework directives um, and uh, reporting on good environmental status. Uh, there was some very interesting discussion, uh, which um, I think Tyler Eros group has, has have talked to as well. And then it's the aligning of ocean accounts within uh, with, with ocean governance tools uh, and, and um, identified that a number of particular countries have advanced marine, marine spatial, spatial planning, planning programs, programs uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, oceans, oceans accounting account can really provide, provide the underpinning, the underpinning data, data for uh, in terms of the implementation of, of marine spatial plans. Uh, the opportunities for collaboration within academia and research uh, um, entities was identified uh, to access expertise, uh, particularly related to the transdisciplinary approaches here. Um, there were a number of barriers that were identified. Uh, one that came across uh, hugely across different disciplines was uh, access or data, um, access to data, uh, aspects of data. Um, quite interestingly enough, um, the challenges with data are really, really related to many of these data may be available. Um, it was identified that there may be a lot more data available than than you than one initially thinks. Um, but but um, in in this aspect, um, it's still uh, probably less data than than is actually needed. Um, mention is made of the uh, UNFWC and C data set as a, uh, as a data uh, source, a data portal. Um, but there were aspects in, in the challenges um, relating to, 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 to data is that data are quite often highly siloed, uh, therefore unstandardized, um, not uh, archived in common formats. Um, and there are uh, aspects of those challenges there. Another challenge that was raised was uh, spatial aspects of, of data uh, and particularly challenges um, expressed in, in terms of geospatial standards uh, within uh, spatial data um, analyses, for example. For example. Um, challenges in terms of scaling were also identified uh, in terms of the way uh, local pilot accounts or regional uh, subnational accounts need to be scaled or might need to be scaled uh, into the national basis. Uh, we had some discussion on future uh, um, approaches, uh, future directions. There's some interesting uh, aspects in terms of challenges were mentioned there, um, particularly mentioned by um, one, um, one intervention there was the aspect of moving from uh, non-renewable to renewable energy sources um, within uh, the accounts framework and the need for accounts framework to start looking towards more uh, renewable approaches. Um, and the other important aspect in terms of the future was uh, really looking at the development of partnerships and collaborations uh, and the sharing of lessons, lessons learned is particularly important um, in terms of, of country experiences uh, and the uh, using success stories to 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 advance ocean accounts. Uh, thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Ken Finley, for your uh, notes. Uh, it was about data and also the challenges, as you mentioned before. Um, uh, hopefully all the challenges can be put as uh, this basis as well as we want to move forward and make actions. So thank you, uh, Professor Ken Finley. I don't know why I'm always tend to, tempted to call you Professor, but not for now, just Ken Finley. Thank you again. And now we still have the last rapporteur, uh, Jonathan Koo from Group 3. Go ahead, Jonathan. Thanks very much, facilitator. So um, uh, our group was talking about the um, use of oceans accounts in policy and decision making um, for sustainable oceans. I've taken there was a there was some really good discussion from across the um, group. So I just wanted to, at the outset to say thank you to everyone who contributed to that discussion. There were three there were three points that I wanted to sort of report report back as the um, uh, I guess the sort of key things that I thought that that would be worthwhile to to think about taking taking forward. Um, 
the first, and again, in some respects, I'll also sort of say that there's some some commonality, I think, with um uh, with the um uh, the other rapporteurs as well. So the first thing I sort of mentioned is a, is around um uh, the coordination and the importance that we have a partnership across a range of different uh, potential potential users and use cases. Um, there was a there was some 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 examples given of where things um hadn't worked so well, and and one of those examples of was where um there'd been I guess sort of a um what, there'd been not not an ongoing sort of set of work it had been sort of a stop start type sort of piece of piece of sort of work in particular areas with respect to oceans and that um lack of continuity i think hurts the um uh, the ability to be able to tell that sort of story in a consistent way um and to sort of get the momentum um in terms of um building up technical expertise and and the way that we're able to um keep 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 and keep a set of accounts moving um with that in with that specifically in mind um one area around um, that in, um, that coordination that that was important was thinking around uh, particularly our, our national yeah, statistical statistical offices um, I'm not saying that just because I'm in the national statistics office someone else made that comment um, but I thought that that was a worthwhile thing to say not only because I guess of thinking about that sort of ongoing process that um, that a, a range of national statistics um, uh, will go through um, in terms of an ongoing set of um, uh, um, information. But also that the fact that the um, the National Statistics Office is also the holder of a, a wealth of other information that can either complement or potentially be utilised um, uh, in, in in concert with um, with the ocean accounts to tell a richer, more whole story in terms of um, the, uh, um, the 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 impact of um, uh, sustainable sustainable oceans. Um, and I think um, there's, there's some similar similar comments to um, what Ken just mentioned earlier about having that sort of um, the stakeholders involved at uh, across the um, uh, across the um, uh, design process. So again, I think that sort of partnerships um, sort of theme was was an important theme. The second theme I sort of mentioned is around um, policy and linking, making sure that what you're able to 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 to, to do links in closely. Um, with key um, key policy um, uh, um, uh, angles within your within your country um, that that resonate. Um, so again, there are a couple of a couple of sort of examples of that that we discussed. We're thinking um, at different levels. So again, engagement um, not just at, at national um, and um, sub um, like uh, state or um, a sub national government, but but also local and smaller regional governments to make sure that um, that that there's an opportunity to sort of link those together. And to demonstrate that there are some um, that there are a range of different um, uh, questions that can be answered um, with the ocean accounts, and an example of an, an area where um, uh, ocean accounts some um, uh, could could be looking at over 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 the next um, uh, um, uh, over the next some um, medium short to medium term is to be thinking about things like the um, uh, in, uh, the COVID recovery um, across all our countries and um, uh, how it might be contributing to um, more sustainable um, economy as we as we look at recovery. And then the third point I'll make um, is that one of the one of the one of the things that we discussed was that um, there's a range of different information depending on um, which audience you might be looking at targeting your accounts at. So you know indicators and sort of high level sort of indicators um, are, are, are probably the most important for the um, some of our key decision makers or the public more broadly, so that we're able to. Um, uh, to try to get to, to try to make sure that there's an interest and an understanding of, of what um, of how um, how sustainable oceans are, are going, um, but I think it was also recognised that that that's that's difficult and um, whatever you whatever you choose in that space you know may have flaws in it. So again, um, you know if I think about um, in the in the um, uh, economic space we all know there are flaws um, uh, in terms of how we measure um, economic activity is gross domestic product but that doesn't mean that it's not used and, and it's a starting point so you know I think maybe there are some there's some elements there where we can start to think about what what might be some of those key indicators that we would like to take out of a set of ocean accounts and um, and promote those so that um, we're able to start to highlight um, uh, how we might be progressing um, from a sustainable um, oceans perspective that we can then engage and understand how we can improve. That's all from me. Um, I'll pass pass back. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, and I really appreciate all the rapporteurs for the notes, to for the important points taken as well. So hopefully this will then feed into the closing session and serve as a potential basis for a partnership agenda for action on ocean accounting. Uh, this is consistent with the spirit of the dialogue. And therefore, um, let's hear the outline again of way forward and potential elements for an agenda for action. Once again, I would like to call upon Go up, Secretary Director Ben Milligan. Hi, Ben. Join us. Join me in the screen. Are you here? So, Ben, um, what's the highlight um, or the outcome that you grasp from the breakout session? I, I saw you in uh, gr Group Three, if I'm not mistaken. Is there any specific reason why you were there? Hi, Ben. Can you hear me? Oh, I think we need to unmute him. Thank you. I've been placed on compulsory muting, which was probably a wise decision by the organizers. Now we can hear you. Apologies, everybody. Um, yes, uh, Alia, could you please repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so I was just yeah, asking, was just asking uh, did you find any uh, potential um, highlights or outcomes that you get during the breakout sessions? And I also saw you in breakout group three. So I was wondering, is there any specific reasoning why you were there? Absolutely. Well, uh, my, my expertise is more in the youth domain of this issue. So as we've heard throughout the discussion, there's, there's a whole range of challenges we need to confront to build ocean accounts that support decision making. We need to be thinking in very technical ways about how to bring together data, about how to um, organize that data, the processes to support linking of that into decision-making processes. Uh, and there are just so many different, one of the things that's fascinating and challenging about ocean accounting is there are just so many different specialists that have a role to play. And the role where I am more comfortable is more the policy design and use end of that spectrum, making sure what uh, technical specialists, like many of those who we've heard from today, making sure that what they do fits into the structures of a decision-making process. So that's why I was in group three. Uh, more broadly, I, I think it's, speaking personally, there's a common thread throughout all the, of these discussions, which is the need for really regular dialogue, uh, far beyond the confines of what we could possibly achieve in one single three-hour session. So I think our breakout group rapporteur has very clearly captured some of the elements of an act agenda that could guide our efforts as a, a bottom-up partnership moving forward. How can the Secretariat and the government more generally help turn those actions into reality? Well, one of the things we can do and is, is convene the right discussions uh, and convene the right discussions about mainstreaming of ocean accounts into other oceans governance tools or about uh, integration with ocean data and science collection processes or with uh, processes that generate the right indicators that help uh, demonstrate the value of ocean accounts in changing policy decisions. So, and, and that's just a few. So um, there are so many different areas where we need to have more discussion. And I'm heartened by that because that, that is something a partnership can do. Uh, a partnership is not necessarily the right entity to be um, calibrating enormous centralized flows of resources, but we can be catalytic to help change makers in different countries, um, get advice, feel part of a global community uh, and access resources more effectively that are available to them in lots of different ways. And I think another reflection is we are in a very positive place when it comes to the high level political will around this issue. We heard that very clearly from Minister Trigono, uh, Minister Goldsmith and Secretary Ali Shabana. So that will is there. And there, as we've heard from in the presentations, are an enormous range of pilot efforts all around the world. Connecting those two together so that the pilot initiatives can scale to meet the political demand is, is a key challenge and, and we just can't get there, I don't think, without talking to one another. So my main reflection on next steps is, and I can at the 
At the discretion of the co-chairs take liberty to commit to this is the Secretariat will become much more active in, in trying to convene conversations over the coming year, guided by the themes discussed today. And uh, obviously all members of the partnership will do their utmost to, to support and continue the momentum uh, throughout all of the initiatives that, that we've heard from. So th those are my main reflections, Alia. I'm conscious of the fact we are uh, already running very close to time. Did you have any other questions of me as our facilitator today? Yeah, I was just wondering, why is it so hard sometimes to have this partnership? Because this is a, um, integrated governance and also uh, accounting across uh, you know countries. Do you have any ideas on that? I think everybody, many institutions are calibrated around a set of skills and a specialist focus. And it's, it's difficult sometimes to justify effort that steps out of those individual silos, which are all individually important. Um, and, and one of the things that's been very exciting about the partnership is it's enabled champions in each of those silos to talk to one another. And it's, it's not easy. It inevitably involves um, people from many disciplines not understanding one another very well initially. Uh, as we just heard from the African community of practice, uh, even despite all of the political commitments, the concept of ocean accounting is still very new in a lot of discussions. So um, it, it's difficult, but I think the, the clear signal from our global community of leaders is that we have to persist. That's enshrined in SDG 17. It's enshrined in the Convention on Biological Diversity post-2020 agenda in the work of the high-level panel. So um, we, we continue to do what we can with the scope of agency and resources that we all have collectively available to us. And hopefully that is, is the way positive change is created. To hear from you, Ben. So what I believe is that uh, when we combine all the knowledge, the available knowledge, then we can probably get a clearer picture of the situation. So that enables us to have this uh, agenda moving forward. So before we close this event, it will be a good idea to actually hear the response from our co-hosts for the third global agenda. So I'd like to um, call again um, a representation from Indonesia. We have. Firdos Agung from the Ministry of Marine and Fisheries. So we want to hear from you. What do you think about today's event? Dear colleagues and participants, on behalf of the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries Indonesia, I would like to congratulate all of us for the success of the Third Ocean Dialogue today. Thank you very much for our co-host, the UK government, represented by DIFRA, the Global Ocean Account Partnership Secretariat and Recom Foundation as organizer and all organizations and partners that support this event. I do hope after this event, we can strengthen our efforts to initiate and implement ocean account globally and help country to have better policy formulation and execution for sustainable ocean in the future. Collective actions are a must as the challenges are very enormous. But I believe we can overcome those challenges if we can stay together and work collaboratively. See you in the fourth ocean dialogue. Stay safe and stay happy. Thank you very much, Firdas Agung. So it is a very important to have collective actions. And hopefully uh, we don't only see each other in the fourth global dialogue, but more regular dialogues, as Ben also mentioned earlier. And also now I would like to hear the response from UK. We have Philip James from DEFRA. So, Philip, what do you think about today's global dialogue? Sorry, I was just waiting to be on mute. Yes, you're back. You're um, back. So, <laughs> I'm back. On behalf of the UK and, and DEFRA, um, may I thank our co host the Indonesian uh, Ministry for Marine Affairs and Fisheries and the GOAP Secretariat for preparing such a brilliant event. Um, importantly, I'd like to thank you all, the presenters and the audience, for your participation. The community can only be as strong as it mem its members, and this is an incredibly strong community. That's why the UK is proud to support the Gallup pilots through our year one investment of £1 million from our wider Blue Planet Fund, which was set up to protect the marine environment and to reduce poverty in, across the globe. The investment in GOAP was made because we see ocean accounts as a key enabler for wider progress in the marine space. If we don't know what we have, 
how can we make the appropriate decisions to protect, manage, and sustainably use it? On a personal level, I love joining these dialogues. I always learn a lot, and I'm truly impressed by the amount of fantastic work that's being sort of carried out for our, in our community. I was lucky to be there at the start, and it's clear how much progress has been made since that first meeting in Bangkok, and even since the last partnership meeting. And as the community grows, we can learn more about how we apply ocean accounts in the world and use them to influence the decision making. Ultimately, leading to a more healthy and productive marine environment, able to support our sustainable blue economies. So my thanks again to what our wonderful facilitators, co-hosts, the Go, Go Up Secretariat, presenters, and all of you for joining today. Thank you so much, Phil. It's great to hear from you. And again, we should give our uh, round of applause for everybody for today's global dialogue. And this leads us to the closing of the event. So this event recording and all presentations will be shared in the coming days. So keep an eye out. And it will also come with a link to a feedback survey. We essentially thank you for joining the dialogue today. We kindly ask that you take two minutes to fill in our survey because we're always looking to improve our events so your feedback is very valuable. Again, would like to thank this year's Global Dialogues co-hosts, Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries of Indonesia and the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, or DEFRA. And we've not done it without the supports from UNESCAP, the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy or Ocean Panel, UNSW, Cape Peninsula University of Technology, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Center for Blue Economy Monterey. And on behalf of the organizers, Global Accounts Partnership, or GOAP, and Rakam Nusantara Foundation, we again thank you for attending. See you again in the next Global Dialogue on Ocean Accounts for Ocean Sustainability. Take care for now, and bye-bye. <laughs>